Hey everyone, my name is Michael and today I want to have a look at the new Resolver compiler that we have in Hot Chocolate. So what is the Resolver compiler? It's basically the thing that takes your Resolver and generates all the injection and mapping logic around it and makes it execute smoothly. In the past we used an expression-based Resolver compiler, so basically when we build up the schema, we will collect all the resolvers and then compile at runtime a function around it to have a standardized interface for the executor and have good performance when executing these resolvers. Before we get started, I have a new course on dorm train getting started with GraphQL in .NET. This is not the typical getting started course that you find everywhere else. With over seven and a half hours of content, it teaches what GraphQL is, but also dives deep into patterns and best practices, schema design and schema evolution. The first 300 of you who are getting this course will get a 20% discount with the code STYPE20. If you want to dive even deeper, you can join one of our online workshops where the Core Chili Cream team teaches you everything we know about GraphQL from backend to frontend. And because I'm launching a new course on Dome Train, I'm chipping in a 30% discount on all of our online workshops. Check out our online workshops on learn.chilicream.com. All the links and information you can find below the video in the description. If you like our content, please hit the like and subscribe button below the video. And with that, let's dive in. Okay, let's have a look at the example here. And that's a typical catalog example that I'm using often. And in here, we actually are using the new Resolver compiler. And if you're opting for preview 110 and beyond, that is where you see more and more of this new Resolver compiler coming in. Having that set for this initial wave, we are planning to just use it at certain parts of your graph. So at the moment we have here the types and you can see that we, for instance, have this brand node type and there we have a field here or a resolver and this resolver we are using already with the resolver compiler. So the resolver compiler now, the new one, uses source generator to generate a resolver for this resolver here. And we can go up here into the resolvers file and there you can see this is a brand node resolvers and you see here's a bit of initialization code. I will explain that later. And then we have down here the actual resolver that we are using and you can see here's the injection code that we generate. Before we dive into that, let me maybe explain why the resolver compiler actually was a very complicated thing for us, bringing it to a source generator. The first thing is that we allow to change the source generator by the consumers of the API. So everybody could go and implement their own resolver compiler integration. We call that a parameter expression builder. And that is quite useful. Think about this. We have here our GraphQL setup and we might want to maybe inject the, the user session into our resolvers. Let's for instance say we have here a session and I already created one. We have here this default session and this default session has a user and this user object is what we're gonna use within our resolvers and business logic and uh, we wanna have an easy way to inject it basically. So for this session, we also have here a session HTTP request interceptor. And that is what sits between the transport, the HTTP request coming in and actually the GraphQL execution. So if we invoke a request against our GraphQL server, this interceptor will check out the headers. This is not about security, just about the functionality. If we have a user ID on the header, we are gonna try to parse it here and then load actually a user from our database. And when we can find that user, we're gonna put it here on this session. In this instance, this session is actually in our DI system. So we are just setting it there and then you could inject this session. But let's say we wanna change our resolver compiler to actually have the user injectable on our system. So what we could do is actually create some state for that on the request. So you can see here the operation request builder and I could take that and I could say set global state and then we could say the state is called current user and then we're gonna inject here the user. So with this, with every request, we have a state associated with the request and we could use that now. So the easiest way we could use this state is just by injecting it. So I could go, for instance, to, to my brand 
type here and we could introduce a new resolver and this resolver maybe just gives us the username back doesn't make really sense but let's just go with it so we say get username and then i could say this is actually uh, something we have on the global state and we call current user and then this already would work we would use here the internal state system and uh, we already have an expression builder for that it would pick up the attribute here then uh, make sure that this is injected from the right place let's uh, quickly run that so our server is up i'm going to banana cake pop create a new tab and then we're going to write a new request here so we go for brands and then you can see here with brands we also have now the username that is the resolver we, we have introduced and we can now use our header here user id one to get the right user and you can see this is sam at the moment and if we introduce two we get the support for instance okay this controls how we can inject something into our request so we could make this even easier and say actually every time i want to have a user here i don't want to think about the global state and i also don't want to match the key in the global state because this is actually the key we are looking up in the global state. And if we don't use that as an argument name, we would have to specify this here. But we could also say, let's change that. So we just need to inject the user here. And in the moment I would do that, this would actually become an input because the resolver compiler would figure out, okay, this is not a service. So this must be an argument and then user must be an input. So if I refresh that, you can see this now demands here an input and that is uh, the user. I could pass that in, which is foo. I also ne would need to pass in all the other things because it just blindly generated everything for this user type. So this is actually not what we want. We want actually to automatically inject this from the right space. So what we actually need is a parameter expression builder and we can go back to our configuration and then we could introduce the add parameter expression builder here. So this works with Hot Chocolate 30 and that's actually what we have today. That's also why it's so complex to get everything into a source generator because we allow for this flexibility here. So with the resolver compiler, I could say, I want to have the context, this is the resolver context. And then we say, get global state. We want to have the user and, and the key is the current user, right? And then we just return it. So if I just register it like this, we look just for the type here. So the parameter expression builder just looks at the type and will inject it. We could also have a custom handler here where we say, actually, we analyze the parameter info and only if uh, we find the parameter info has the right attribute or has whatever other condition, this expression will be compiled into the resolver compiler to inject the value. So we just use this guy here. The problem with this expression builder now is it would work if we have it actually on one of the old types, but with this new kind of type, with the object type attribute, we are already using the new compiler. And that means we don't get actually these expression builders anymore because we are using here this source generator. Let's quickly emulate that. So I'm gonna introduce a second class here and we use here the extend object type and we put that in here and now we're going to try it out so i go here let's feed in id1 and we're going to run that and you can see this works now i probably could also debug it just set here a breakpoint then you can see it's hitting here the set global state and then we don't get to see that it actually hits our parameter expression builder because it's compiled so how do we get that with the source generator because the moment i move this guy again up into my brand node type this is actually not going to work anymore and i actually get an error if we run that you can see we get an error this in the source generated code this is also one major advantage that you have now with the source generated code you can debug into it whereas the expression code you cannot debug into it you don't get these nice breakpoints okay this doesn't work we have an issue here and uh, that is where we really designed the new architecture around so we still want to have this guy here but we want to have this in a way where you can still do the expression compilation, but also at the same time define now this new structure. So at the moment, we just have a class set up for that. We are still refining that. 
So we can go and create here a class and that's the user parameter binding factory. So by the way, ideally you co-locate that. So let's actually write this guy here as a class. So the idea was if you have something like this, we want to make it very easy so you can just add this additional thing. And uh, we actually have the custom parameter expression builder here. That's actually, I think, what we use beneath this extension method. It's this custom parameter expression builder class, and you can just pass an expression into it. So I can say this is of the type user, and then we can grab this expression here, and we're gonna put it in here. Let's reformat that. Okay, now it looks nice. So for the source generator, we can just add one more interface, and that is the parameter binding factory. And the parameter binding factory creates a parameter binding. And this parameter binding we can use at runtime. So the idea is you tell us what the parameter is about if we don't know it, and you can do mostly everything that you did with the parameter expression builder. So in this case, we could just create here a parameter binding. And actually, because this is very static, what we do here, we just have a fixed key and a global state we can implement the parameter binding here as well with this single instance. So why we actually allow for a parameter binding to be created is if you have state, if you want to scope certain data from the attribute, maybe, maybe there's a, a key on the attribute or something like this. You could just strap that once, encapsulate that in the parameter binding instance and pass that to the source generated code. In our case, we don't need that. So we just going to say this is the instance that is also the binding. And then we have two properties here that we have to fulfill. And that is the kind, what kind we are. And in this case, we're going to say this is a custom binding. And this binding is pure. So what pure means is that this has no side effect on the resolver. So there's just global state. And if something is pure, we can inline that in the parent resolver. It's about performance. So in this case, we are saying this is a pure binding because there is no side effect. And then we just grab this guy here. We basically copy it down here. And then we have this new parameter binding here. And instead of registering it like this here, we're going to make that possible again. But this is the state of things. So we're going to say we add a singleton to our service and then we register it for the expression builder and also for the binding factory. Binding here the same type to different interfaces allows us now to use the same functionality and this could even be shared here and we recognize that uh, for instance the F sharp community will not opt into the C sharp compiler that we have now the C sharp source generator and uh, that is why we want to keep both of the systems working and if you if you're building an extension for instance then it's wise to implement both if you're just working in your own project, uh, you could decide for either of these approaches. Okay, with this in, we can rerun our solution. Then we rerun here our query and then it works again. And now it's running through our C sharp code. So I could go here to the binding. This is the binding. We can run that and then you can see it's actually running through this binding. We could now debug and then we are back in here. So let's have a look at the compilation actually and see how that works. So the compiler is actually pretty smart and we're gonna analyze what you have in the code. So we have here the brand resolver, the brand node resolver, and we try to avoid to have these bindings because often we can compile a much more efficient way to get certain things. For instance, if we look at this resolver, you can see that we're gonna just use the parent directly. We're not waiting here for a binding. So we compile the actual expression in here. Same goes for the cancellation token, we just have that. But there are certain things like in this approach, we are using this paging arguments. And this paging arguments is for a layered architecture where this actually is used in the domain model. And Hot Chocolate actually doesn't know how to deal with paging arguments. For this, we have a binding because this is a customization for the Resolver compiler. Same goes for services. We don't know what this service is, how it works. We don't even know if it's a service, if you don't put an attribute on. If you put an attribute on, we can actually 
simplify this expression and you have the actual injection code here. In this case, we are deferring to a binding which handles the DI injection. And then the actual resolver we wrote here, you can see this is the binding that we resolve here. And we wanna have this user binding here. So we are passing this as a generic in, and then we pass that into our resolver here. And this resolver, if we would dive into it, is here our code. So it calls directly our code. How this works actually is that we first initialize the bindings. And this initialization is triggered from the type, from the type initialization. So we also generate the type now. And for this, I'm going here to the source generator again, and you see here the types. This is the type code for brand. And you can see here's the type initialization. We actually gonna capture still the member here. And we do that to preserve the functionality that we have, how names are inferred. This is not relevant for AOT, so it's just looking up some metadata around the member. But then we have here the resolver compiler. So this is actually the compiled resolver we are using here. And uh, this also depends on how the bindings are. So we will inspect the bindings depending on what bindings they are. We might generate a slightly different resolver. Like you can see here, each resolver actually has this factory and this factory returns here the field resolver delegates. And depending on if it's really a pure resolver, and we're gonna inspect here the arguments that we have, if they are run through a binding, right? If we, for instance, if we, for instance, know all the bindings, then we don't have this inspection code like here. But in this case, we don't understand what this binding is, if it's pure, so we're gonna just check this binding and then depending on the outcome, generate a pure resolver that can be folded into its parent resolver execution or a resolver that is run in its own task context. So this stuff doesn't only work with just standard resolvers that I have here. We are putting it in more and more places. So we started out with just the uh, standard resolvers that you have here. But if I, for instance, write now a node resolver, I have here the ID mapped, then I can just say, this is my node resolver. Then we can have a quick look at our source generator here. So we are producing now again, the brand node here, but we now see that you are using a node resolver. And that means in the configuration that we generate now here, it implements now the node. So it recognizes you are basically declaring that this is a node. So we're gonna implement the node interface here in the configuration. And we also invoke then here the resolver that we wrote there as the node resolver. Again, this is not only about resolver code that now becomes more transparent, but it also uh, is more transparent how hot chocolate infers things. Like what many people call the magic of hot chocolate, where we make assumptions around what you mean with types and how we should interpret them. It's basically spelled out here in the types code where you now can see, okay, this translates actually into this fluent code block and uh, you can reason about that, you can debug it. And this is as opposed to what we did with the startup reflection. And then we compiled the, the whole system with expressions, which was not so easy to sometimes understand why certain things happen and now they become much more transparent. And we could also debug this configuration. So I could put a breakpoint here. I could start that and debug into it and see what certain values are during the configuration. This is how we approach Hot Chocolate 14, the types. It will not be everywhere. So you will see more and more places where this pops up. Uh, there are still a lot of challenges we have that we are trying to navigate. But uh, what do you think about this first bits and pieces about the new resolver and type compiler that is coming in and that makes it more and more transparent what is happening under the hoods. Sound out in the comments. If you want to help our projects, please go to GitHub and give us the GitHub star. This is the easiest way to contribute or give back to an open source project. And with this, I'm out.